Well, good morning, everybody. How is everybody doing today? Excellent. It's so good to be with you here in the sanctuary online. We're so grateful to get to gather together, to pray, to reflect, to sing. And I always, when I go away, I'm glad to come back to you. Last weekend, I was preaching at the First Scots Church in Charleston. While Kelly was preaching here, I was there. Normally, when I go preach somewhere, usually I say greetings on behalf of the Peachtree Presbyterian Church, which has been around for 110 years. I didn't do that in this instance because First Scots Church has been around since 1731. There wasn't even a Presbyterian church yet. There was only a Church of Scotland in the United States. That is why it's called First Scots. And so I am so glad to get to be with you today and so excited to share in today's topic. And I want to begin today by telling you about a time when I was back working on my doctorate. The rhythm is that I would fly from the East Coast over to the West Coast because I did my doctoral studies in this place. This is Pasadena, California. This is the City Hall of Pasadena, California, which is across the street from the campus of Fuller Theological Seminary. And in this screen, it's very important to notice the awnings on the left-hand side there because that is the California Pizza Kitchen that is located right next to the campus that has a very price-sensitive happy hour menu that if you're willing to eat dinner before six o'clock at night, the doctoral students would all migrate from out of class over to the CPK in order to be able to get our nourishment because we had very limited budgets. And so it was often that we would walk by and you would see all kinds of students and faculty there on this one particular occasion. It was a former professor of mine sitting with somebody else and they invited me to come and to sit with them. And so I came and I sat with them for a little while and I introduced myself to the guest who was there. He told me that his name was Ralph. I said, my name is Rich. And we struck up a conversation and By the time we got to the end of that conversation, of which we talked a great deal about the movies, and I am not very shy, so I offer my opinion on basically everything. And this guy who was with my former professor, he was there helping a class, talking about the movies, and then eventually this guy named Ralph got up and left because he had somewhere else to be. And my former professor, now friend, looked at me and said, you really have no idea who he is, do you? I'm like, yeah, I do. His name's Ralph. And they're like, yeah, that's Ralph Winter. That's the executive producer for a series called Star Trek and all the movies. That's the executive producer for all of the X-Men films. Have you ever rewound a conversation in your head with a new bit of information that you now have? That's what I'm doing. Because I'm rewinding and said, you know what? I would have listened differently had I known who that was. I would have talked differently. I would have pretended to know less. I would have been more interested rather than being more interesting. It would have reshaped that entire conversation had I really understood who I was dealing with. Today, I want to talk to you about prayer. And in talking to you about prayer, I don't want to fall into the mistake that most of us make as pastors into thinking what you need is another technique or a tip or a hack in order to be able to understand prayer. What I want to say is I think the primary reason that we don't pray more and more authentically is theological. That if I could join with you in a one-on-one prayer session, I might say to you lovingly the same thing that that professor friend said to me. You really have no idea who that is, do you? That when you close your eyes and you engage in that conversation, that the image and the understanding and the perspective and the knowledge that you have of the one that you were engaged in conversation with, if you knew, if you could see who it is that you were talking to, it would be different. 
We're in the midst of a series where we're walking through the book of Acts, and we've looked at the early parts of the book of Acts, kind of like the different facets of the kingdom of God and all of its glory, different dimensions like power and spirit and courage and curiosity and all these different dimensions. And today we're talking about prayer, and in reality, we could have stopped all along this journey to talk at any point about prayer. Because you see, when you think about the book of Acts and you walk through the book of Acts, you cannot help but stub your toes on the reality of their prayer life and how different it is from ours. For you see, right there at the very beginning of the book of Acts in the first chapter, when they're trying to fill the seat for the apostle because Judas is no longer with them, they all join together constantly in what? In the midst of the anxiety of leadership there. And then when you get a glimpse and you look at the early church and it talks about in chapter 2 what the early church was like, it says that they were devoted. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to what? And to prayer. By the time you turn the page in your Bible and you get to the third chapter of the book of Acts, Peter is about to do one of his most significant miracles, and he is walking towards the temple. And it says that one day, Peter and John were going to the temple at the time of what? Of prayer. And then when you get to the sixth chapter, when you're dealing with a leadership crisis, and they are commissioning and identifying new leaders in the church for deacons, And it says that they will give our attention to prayer. And last week when Kelly preached, I don't know if you noticed, in chapter 10, before God gives his incredible, not just life-altering, but destiny-altering vision of the church, this happens when Peter goes up to the rooftop to pray. If you read the early history of the church, it is primarily a theological history, and on every page, it is saturated with a people who are devoted and disciplined in prayer. Is that our reality? If someone could genuinely see peach tree in all of its fullness, would they see us devoted and disciplined in our prayer? And my argument is that the primary reason that we don't is not because of a technique or a tip, but because we don't see Him for who He really is. And so today we're going to look at Acts chapter 12, and we are going to do so by discovering how our prayer life might be different if we understood who God really was. We're going to start reading in the first verse. It was about this time that King Herod arrested those who belonged to the church, intending to persecute him. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Pause right there for a moment just to let me tell you that here you have King Herod trying to silence the king of kings, and he's willing to do so with death. When he saw this, it was met with positive approval ratings. Among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of the unleavened bread, and after arresting Peter, he put him into prison, handing him over to the guards to four squads of four soldiers each. One guard would normally be enough, maybe two. And Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after Passover, and so Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. When the early church historian Luke writes about the prayer of the early church, he uses this one word. He says that they pray earnestly. This is the very same verb that Luke uses to describe, the only other time he uses this verb, to describe the prayers of Jesus at the end of the book of Luke, to describe the prayers of Jesus when he is in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is pouring out his heart, his spirit before Almighty God. 
talks about him being in anguish. And so he prayed more and more earnestly. I find that for those of us who are Presbyterians, we tend to be on the more polite side of the prayer spectrum. And earnest prayers are not necessarily a part of the way that we pray. A couple of years ago, we went to go visit Kelly's grandmother for her 99th birthday, Mima, And so all of the grandkids and everybody and the great grandkids pulled together to go visit Mima at the John Knox Retirement Community in Florida that was originally founded by the Presbyterians and then had been taken over by the Lutherans and now is being run by the Roman Catholics. It's a little confusing, but they kept the name John Knox, which I think is really funny that there's a famous reformer who actually runs a Catholic, you know, uh, kind of care facility, but that's just a little bit of an aside. We're there, we're meeting with Mima, and at one point in her wheelchair, she grabs my hand with a vice grip, and she says, will you pray for me? And I say, of course, Mima, I will pray for you. And I try to let go of her hand, and there is no letting go of that hand. And so I have everybody gather around, and I'm kind of gathering everybody around, but Mima wants to say something else to me and pulls me close to her before I start praying. I lean in close to Mima, and she looks at me with fierce fire in her eyes, and she says, you better make it a good one. (laughs) I start laughing. I'm like, okay, Mima, I'll bring my A game. We all chuckled at that, but you had to pause for a moment. What did Mima mean by make it a good one? Do you think she wanted really big words in it? Do you think she wanted it to have flowery language and she wanted it to, to be poetic? And Mima was from a, a small town in Virginia and lived a really hard life in the midst of poverty. Struggled with some incredible family issues where there were gambling addictions. Do you think when she was saying make it a good one, that's what she was talking about? No. When you're 99 years old in what turned out to be the last year of her life, you don't care about the loftiness of the words. You only care about the sincerity and the earnestness of the plea. That's what she wanted. I want to introduce you to another member of the Conwisher family that we don't often talk about. This is Austin. Austin was a pre-COVID puppy that came to the Conwisher house. Austin, I'm a little biased, but is one of the most handsome dogs you'll ever meet. I have no illusions that Austin is Kelly's dog. You see, Kelly works from home, and it doesn't matter if Danica and Ashby and I are in the house. Austin follows Kelly around wherever she goes, and we are only second and third and fourth string if Kelly is not there. He will follow her anywhere in the house. There's only one time where this changes, and that is if I light the grill on the back patio. (laughs) And then all of a sudden, Austin is my puppy. And he sits there with those longing eyes as I flip the burgers. Martin Luther once said, you don't know how to pray until you have eaten a sandwich in front of a dog. When you think about the earnestness of Austin for me on grilling days, this needs to be the spirit and attentiveness that we have before God in prayer. 
Vincent Van Gogh worked in the mission field early on in his life and was amazed by, in the midst of the poverty of the working class, he was amazed of their prayer life. Here is one of his early sketches of a man in prayer, someone who didn't take for granted the hot meal at the end of a day. And towards the end of his life, Vincent Van Gogh was very confused, but one thing he still knew. He knew what earnest pleas, earnest prayers were. Are you willing to take some of the stained glass out of your prayer life? Are you willing to allow your raw self before God? We must lay before Him what is in us and not what we think ought to be in us. My friends, pray earnestly. Let's keep reading in the story. And so the church at this point is praying, and Peter, by a miraculous escape, is able to get out of that prison. When this had dawned on Peter, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the door at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came and answered the door. And when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter's at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. And when she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. The first thing that the apostles get right is to pray earnestly. The second thing, which is an example of what they get wrong, is to pray expectantly. Their prayers were earnest, they were sincere, they were heartfelt. I'm sure that they had prayed earnestly for James when he was in prison before King Herod, and James didn't make it out alive. And so they're praying earnestly for Peter. They have not given up, and yet they don't pray with the expectation that anything is going to change. I love the fact that you have this absolutely humorous image of Peter being rescued miraculously from jail. He's knocking on the door of the house where they are praying earnestly for him. And yet they don't believe that he's actually there. True story of a pastor. I believe this was Will Willimon, but I didn't have time to look this up, where one time he was asked to come to a hospital room in order to pray for somebody who was in need of healing. And he went to the hospital room, and he prayed, and as Pastor Vicki can tell you, most of the time when you go in, you pray, you trust that prayer to God, but you don't often see the results. This was one of those instances where he prayed, the person was instantly healed, and that that person got to leave the hospital. This really freaked the pastor out. And he went down the hallway without saying anything, and he went down the elevator without saying anything, and he got in his car, and he closed the car door, and he looked up in heaven, and he said, God, don't you ever do that to me again. <laughs> and the reason that I love that story is that if we're not careful, and I am particularly susceptible to this, if we're not careful, we pray in such a way that we are managing our expectations before God as opposed to casting our cares really upon Him. That we pray in such a way that we're really doing a spiritual form of emotional management and meditation as opposed to really knocking on heaven's door and praying with anticipation and praying with hope and praying with expectation. And that does not always mean, my friends, that, that it turns out the way that you think it will. 
When I became the pastor of this congregation in Summit, New Jersey, very traditional congregation, two Tiffany windows on the inside, they loved their sanctuary. I did something at the outset that nobody should ever do at the beginning of a ministry like mine. I altered the pulpit without talking to a committee, a person, or anyone. But don't worry, the alteration to the pulpit was something that no one else could see. I made a little plaque and put the date April 4th, 2001, which was the first day, Easter day, that I was preaching. And I screwed that plaque into the pulpit so that every time I would place my hand on the side of the pulpit, it would naturally rest upon the phrase, expect a miracle. Pastors can be some of the most jaded people that I know. And after a while, when you're not careful and diligent, you can forget that God does great miracles. And so I pray, and I believe that God is creating unity as I pray. And I pray, and I believe that God is rescuing marriages as I pray. And I pray and I believe that God is instilling forgiveness in families that are broken. And I pray and I believe that this community is not forsaken and will change because we pray. And so as I pray, I don't want to be the kind of person who prays, who looks up at heaven and says, don't you ever do that to me again. Because I become so cynical. If you really knew who he was and is, you would pray earnestly and you would pray expectantly. So I don't have a technique for you. I don't have a hack. I don't have a tip. What I will tell you is to look deep into the character and the person of God and just start praying. I have a friend who um, had just this incredible trip to this location. This is Machu Picchu and it's one of the incredible wonders of the world up in the Andes Mountains. And he had such a great experience and told so many people about it, he actually ended up uh, kind of leading a couple's trip to go, look at the paths that you walk along. You can do it where you do kind of like a three or four day hike. Look at the vistas that you are privy to. When he led the group, it was very different from the time that he did it the first one. For you see, when he led the group, you couldn't see any of those vistas. For you see, the clouds had descended and a fog had filled the area. And so they walked along the path. And he had to keep telling them, we're going the right direction. I promise you, all this fog that's over on this side and on this side, it's absolutely beautiful. You can't see it, but it's amazing. And for days and days, they walked in the midst of the clouds. But they had to walk by faith. They couldn't walk by sight. When he came back a couple of years ago and told me this story, I laughed because I said, you know, sometimes this is what it feels like for me as a pastor. That I feel like I've been given the privilege to see something, to be a part of something. And I'm inviting you to come along. And now we see in the mirror dimly. And maybe you're going to have to take it upon faith. But I promise you, if you keep walking in prayer, if you keep going, there's a huge payout with incredible vistas of God's beauty and majesty and wonder if you just keep walking.
And so as we close this message, I want to invite you not just for me to close the message in prayer, but to start a prayer that I hope that you will pick up later and keep on praying. And that if somebody was going to write the book about our church in this moment in time, that they couldn't help write that book without talking about the devotion and the discipline and the desperation of our earnest and expectant prayers. So let's pray together. Father, we ask in this moment that in the confusion and the fog of this world that you would help us to be able to see. I imagine that there's people here right now, God, who have walked and walked and they're ready to give up. May you fill us in this moment with the assurance that can only come from you. That our prayers are not good because they have the right words, but it's the character of the one that we are praying to. And so we can trust you, God. We can trust you when things don't work out. We can trust you when things are miraculously changed. Lord, I I pray that you will help us to become a people of prayer. That this will not just be a message filled with scripture and wisdom and stories. May it be a turning point in which we cling to you in a whole new way. I ask for you to forgive us for trying to manage expectations in prayer instead of just boldly asking. I ask you to forgive us for our distant, haphazard, and infrequent prayers instead of earnestly throwing our lives before your throne of grace. Change us, God be filled with wonder as we now come to terms with the one that we did not realize who you really were. And we pray these things in Jesus' name.